For many years, I was regarded as an alien. Since I was a foreign-born person who was not a U.S. citizen, but it was legally recorded as a resident of the country, I was labeled as a resident alien. As a child, I couldn't understand why I was designated that way. Where I came from, we had coconut trees and beautiful beaches. Sure, we ate mangoes and plenty of fish, but why that made me an alien was beyond my comprehension as a 10-year-old boy who had just arrived on the strange shores of the United States of America. It is estimated that more than one million resident aliens arrive in the U.S. each year. These foreign-born individuals are lawfully recognized as residents of the country and allowed to live and work even though they are not U.S. citizens. As legal immigrants, they must have a green card or pass a substantial presence test. They are also subject to the same taxes as other U.S. citizens. They are there are other terms that may be used to identify the status of a resident alien. The following identifications, which are more precise and politically correct, are used interchangeably. Legal immigrant, permanent resident, or green card holder. In 2018, there were about 44.8 million legal immigrants living in the U.S. Approximately one in seven U.S. residents was foreign-born. While an exact number is impossible to determine, the number of undocumented immigrants living in the U.S. ranged from 10.5 to 12 million in 2019. Undocumented immigrants or foreign-born people who do not possess a valid visa or other immigration document because they enter the U.S. without inspection, stay longer than their temporary visa permitted, or otherwise violated the terms under the which they were admitted. A person entering or remaining in the U.S. without valid documentation is in violation of federal immigration laws. These folks are often labeled as illegal aliens. In 2016, the Library of Congress announced that it would use non-citizens or unauthorized immigrants as a bibliographical term rather than calling them illegal aliens. This once common designation had become offensive. Unfortunately, this unpleasant identification persists among top politicians and continues to appear in many official documents and government websites. Illegal immigration is a matter of intense debate in the U.S. and in many parts of the world. How should Christians respond to this extremely controversial and a volatile issue? Intriguingly, there is fervent claim of biblical support on both sides. The immigration debate is complex. Among the many issues involved, two are most contentious. First, those who immigrate to the U.S., for example, without going through the proper legal channels are here illegal, illegally and therefore are illegal immigrants. According to some, these people should be labeled as such and not the euphemistic undocumented immigrants. Furthermore, these immigrants should have no expectations that their lives here should be the same as those who are illegal citizens. They broke the law to come here and should expect to be deported by the official, by the Office of the Immigration and Custom Enforcement, known as ICE. This side of the debate strongly advocates for immigration reform that would not favor a path to legal status and citizenship for illegal or undocumented immigrants. Second, the immigration debate centers on the issue of borders. There are those who advocate for an open border policy, 
fully or conditionally. The U.S. is a nation built by immigrants. A core American value is that everyone has a chance to succeed because as long as you work hard, you will find a place in this country. Constructing a wall at the border denies this basic principle and is therefore un-American. Oppon opponents of fully open borders have argued that this view is crazy and senseless. In January 2017, the U.S. government signed two executive orders related to immigration and border security moving ahead with the plans to build a wall along the U.S. border with Mexico and uh, to deport people who were in the country illegally. This view is based on the typical image of immigrants sneaking across the U.S.-Mexican border. But only about half of the undocumented immigrants arrived this way. The other half, less noted, and rarely making the headline news, arrive legally, typically on work, tourist, or student visas, but then overstay their visa status. National sovereignty is the heart of the immigration debate. For many Christians, the idea of a sovereign nation enforcing its own immigration policy and protecting its borders does not contradict the teaching of Scripture. Proponents of this position usually turn to Romans chapter 13, verse 1 to 2, or 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 to 14. These two texts basically teach that Christians should obey the laws of a sovereign nation, thus supporting, enabling, and or encouraging illegal immigration is a violation of God's word. Interestingly, the church does not oppose the right of sovereign nations to control their borders and territories. However, it also recognizes the right of people to migrate when it is necessary. The pastoral letter concerning migration from the Catholic bishops of Mexico and the U.S., known as Strangers No Longer, Together on the Journey of Hope, came out in 2003. It states, the church recognizes the right of a foreign state to control its borders in furtherance of the common good. It also recognizes the right of human persons to migrate so that they can realize their own God-given rights. These teachings complement each other. While the sovereign state may impose reasonable limits on immigration, the common good is not served when the basic human rights of the individual are violated. Realizing the danger of branding all undocumented immigrants as rapists or drug traffickers, Pope Francis called on the U.S. and the world to adopt a humanitarian approach to those crossing borders, especially children. The Pope said at a global conference in Mexico in 2014, many people forced to immigrate suffer and often die tragically. Many of their rights are violated. They are obligated to separate from their families and, unfortunately, continue to be the subject of racist and xenophobic attitudes. The Pope was keenly aware that Stereotypes and myths about immigrants perpetuate xenophobic attitudes and are often used as a basis for political decisions around the issues of legal and illegal Im uh, immigration. Stereotypes and myths about migration do greatly influence people's views. These myths can heighten xenophobic and cause tension, violence, and unrest. There are many myths about undocumented immigrants. Among the most notable ones are, they are overrunning the country, they steal jobs, they drain the country's social assistance, education, and health care services, they don't pay taxes, 
and building a wall across the border will stop illegals and terrorists from entering the U.S. Facts have shown that these views are pure myths and are not true. Research has shown that undocumented immigrants contribute to economic growth, enhance the welfare of the natives, pay more in tax revenue than they collect, and benefit consumers by reducing the prices of goods and services. Statistics have indicated that immigrants commit less crime than natives. Misconceptions and myths have greatly fueled xenophobia, a fear or hatred of anything strange or foreign, particularly as it relates to people. Anti-immigrant rhetoric and movements are on the rise around the world. For the most part, the Bible is quite favorable towards immigrants. The authors of the Bible overwhelmingly demand a pro-immigrant stance. This position is most forthright in Israel's laws. Throughout the Old Testament, legal teaching, the Israelites are constantly reminded to care for the strangers, migrants, and refugees because they were once foreigners in the land of Egypt. The author of Deuteronomy exalts, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who is not partial and takes no bribe, who executes justice for the orphan and the widow, and who loves the strangers, providing them food and clothing. You shall also love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. The book of Leviticus issues a similar commandment. When an alien resides with you in your land, you shall not oppress the alien. The alien who resides with you shall be to you as the citizen among you. You, sh you shall love the alien as yourself, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Inspired by the memory of Israel's past, the Old Testament legal statutes made sure that the rights of the immigrants were recognized and upheld. In terms of social rights, the immigrants were given the same legal privileges as the native Israelites in the following situation. Seeking asylum, protection from oppression, receiving an annual portion of the tithe, gleaning rights, and receiving equal just justice before a judge. As for religious rights, the Im immigrants were allowed to participate in the following cultic activities and ceremonies, observance of the Sabbath, renewal of the covenant, participation in the various Jewish feasts, such as weeks, tabernacles, Passover, and the Day of Atonement. On the parts of the immigrants residing in the land of Israel, the following expectations and responsibilities were required of them. Be present at the periodic reading of the law. Be subject to the penalties of criminal laws. Observe dietary restrictions and purity laws. Avoid sexual taboos. Refrain from worshiping other gods and blaspheming against the Lord. In general, the laws of the Old Testament were uniquely gracious to immigrants because no other ancient Near Eastern law codes has such instructions. The incentive or motivation to care for the strangers must have come from Israel's collective memory of how God had cared for them when they were estranged, oppressed, and vulnerable. Israel, too, was to love strangers, migrants, and refugees because God does. Neglecting justice for this people is a sin. The biblical command of being kind to immigrants is also binding today. Everyone is responsible to uphold the sacred directive. 
from individuals to institutions to society as a whole. This ethical mandate should especially resonate with us Christians. How should Christians respond to illegal or undocumented immigrants? The same way we respond to anything else, with mercy and love. Quoting the prophet Hosea, Jesus said, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Another of his famous dictums was, Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. If you want to see the face of God, just examine Jesus' words and actions. Jesus is the face of God's mercy. The world is witnessing an increasing level of violence, fear, and hatred that challenges us each day. Racial tensions continue to run high, particularly in the United States, with police killings and police brutality routinely making the news and social media. There are ongoing debates about illegal immigration and border security. News headlines of the plight of refugees around the world continue to pop up on our own screens. Not to mention also the anti-Asian sentiment that's happening in the U.S. From being spat on and verbally harassed to incidents of physical assault, there have been thousands of reported cases in recent months. An elderly Thai immigrant dies after being shoved uh, to the ground. A Filipino-American is slashed in the face with a box cutter. A Chinese woman is slashed and then set on fire. These are just few examples of recent violent attacks on Asian Americans, part of a surge in abuse since the start of the pandemic a year ago. Advocates and activists say these are hate crimes and often linked to the rhetoric that blames Asian people for the spread of COVID-19. This is despicable and wrong. In times like these, talks about mercy may seem unreal and impossible, but mercy does matter now more than ever. At an Easter address, uh, an apostolic blessing known as Ubi et Orbi in the city and the world, Pope Francis said, God's mercy can make even the driest land become a garden, can restore life to dry bones. Let us be renewed by God's mercy. Let us be loved by Jesus. Let us enable the power of His love to transform our lives too. And let us become agents of this mercy, channels to which God can water the earth, protect all creation, and make justice and peace flourish. Mercy is love. Pope St. John Paul II said it so eloquently. Mercy is really love transformed. So we need to understand what love is if we are to penetrate more deeply into what it means to be merciful. We are familiar with St. Paul's famous hymn of love in 1 Corinthians. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I'm nothing. The author of the letters of John also exalted his fellow Christians saying, Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. Jesus Christ defines love in concrete actions, namely, when you feed the hungry, give water to the thirsty, Welcome a stranger, clothe the naked, care for the sick, or visit the prisoner. Truly I tell you, Jesus said, 
just as you did it to one of the least of these who are numbers, members of my family, you did it to me. In short, both testaments call for a more demanding love of those whom we otherwise would consider outsiders.